to I want to share with you. I, I was very touched this past week. I was uh, moved. A young lady that had been here with us for a little while. Um, she went home this week, um, not home to be with the Lord, she went home to Tennessee. Um, she had come here, and not airing all the laundry, but she had come here for some really difficult circumstances. Effectively, she was running away from difficult and challenging circumstances. And she was not just running away from the circumstances. By her own testimony, she was running away from the Lord. She was running away from the Lord, she was running away from home, just so many things. And she found herself here in this place through outreach. She experienced the presence of the Lord, and this past week, she went back home. Now, I'd love to tell you that she went back home, and it was all easy and all good, and there were no circumstances. That's not the case. Uh, she's returning to very difficult circumstances and a very difficult situation. But the point is that she has gone back to face those, and she's gone back different than she was when she left. Come on, somebody. Yeah. She is going back <coughs> to face what was there differently than she was when she left. Amen. I'd like to talk with you this morning about Onesimus, about Philemon, about Paul. We're going to share a message this morning simply entitled, The Onesimus Journey. We are going to look at the life of Paul for a few moments, uh, discuss Paul. We're going to look at, at Philemon, and oftentimes much of the focus of this book is, is on Philemon. It's, it's on Paul. But today, I believe what the Lord would have us to hear is, is really the journey of Onesimus. Amen? Amen. Join me, if you will, this morning in the Scriptures. Um, you're going to read quickly through the introduction and get into the meat of this sandwich. Paul. A prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Timothy our brother, unto Philemon our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of thee in all my prayers, hearing of thy love and thy faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might, much, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul is writing this letter to Philemon. Paul, Paul is actually imprisoned at the moment. He is in jail. He is imprisoned at the moment that he is writing this letter. And he, he's writing to Philemon, and he's making an appeal to Philemon. He's saying, look, Philemon, I, I could appeal to you in what is convenient, what is comfortable, but... Rather, I come to you in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Onesimus literally is a spiritual son of Paul. Onesimus has come to faith in Jesus Christ as he encountered Paul. Now, we can but hazard a guess as to how it is that Onesimus met Paul if Paul was indeed in jail. Come on, somebody. Think about it for a moment. Which in time past was to the unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul's using a play on words here because the, the name Onesimus means one who is profitable. But Paul is saying this Onesimus, he once was unprofitable because Onesimus was a slave. Onesimus was a slave in the house of Philemon. He was in bondage to Philemon. He was a constrained servant. He was not a voluntary servant. He was one constrained into servitude, into slavery. And Paul's saying he's unprofitable. He was an unbeliever. He was just someone that was in the house, but he was in bondage. And he was unprofitable to, to the kingdom. He was unprofitable to Paul. He was unprofitable. And he ran away. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He, he ran away from the house of Philemon. 
He ran away from his bondage. He ran away from his difficulty, from his circumstances. Amen? He was in a place that was uncomfortable, a place that he didn't choose to be, circumstances that were hurtful, and he ran away. The problem is, for Onesimus, when he ran away, a runaway slave could be put to death. In Roman times, Onesimus could literally be put to death. We can imagine that he probably met Paul in jail. Amen? Because Paul's in jail. And he met Onesimus. Now, he, he may have met Onesimus before he wound up in jail, but we can imagine probably he met him. So Onesimus, not only a runaway slave, but he probably got himself in trouble. And he was running from his past. Amen? Amen. How many know a lot of times when you run from your past, you just run into more trouble? Yes. Come on. But something else happened to Onesimus. Onesimus ran into Paul. Onesimus ran into the Lord. Onesimus was running, he fought away from his trouble. Onesimus was really running into God's purpose and God's plans for his life. It says in verse 12, Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels. Paul said, look, I know Onesimus ran away from you. I know Onesimus was running from his past. He was running from the bondage, the oppression. He was, I know he was running away. But Onesimus didn't understand the journey. Onesimus thought he was getting away from something, but from God's perspective, he was getting into something. How many times have we thought we were running away from somebody or something, and we found we were actually running into something? Because God had us set up. God had a plan before we knew there was a purpose. Amen. Come on, son. I'm Amen. preaching better than y'all letting on now. Help me out. <laughs> Help me out. And Paul says, he's met the Lord. He's my son. A spiritual son. Paul said, I, I led him to the Lord. He's a different person than he was when he ran away. In fact, Paul says that he is my own bowels, meaning my own heart, meaning literally we share a oneness. Paul's saying, he's a part of me. This, this Onesimus took this journey because he belonged to another, yet he didn't belong to anybody. He had a birth place, but no birthright. And he ran. He ran from that oppression. He ran from that lost way. He thought he was running away from something. He was actually running into something. In, 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 in the irony... And of all places, he lands in jail, and he encounters Paul. And more importantly, he encounters the Lord Jesus Christ. He encounters the knowledge and the presence and the wisdom of God, and it transforms him. And, and, and I'm just picturing the journey. Imagine with me, if you will, the journey of Onesimus. Onesimus thinking that he's running away from something, and he's actually running into something, and then he gets there, and he probably finds himself in jail. And he's probably thinking, wow, out of the frying pan into the fire. Anybody ever been there? You, you ran away from one thing, you wound up in more trouble than what you started, and you thought, man, where is God? Onesimus probably thought, if there is a God, where is there a God? Or Onesimus maybe thought there, there couldn't possibly be a God, because how could, how, how could I have been born in that bondage? How could I have been stuck in that bondage? I run away and I, I wind up in another bondage. Yet God's got a plan. God's got a purpose, even in the middle of all of this mess. And he meets Paul. And then Onesimus gets born again. And the grass is greener, and the sky is bluer, and the birds sing better. And it's all happy days. And he gets discipled and taught the things of the Lord. And Onesimus is growing in the Lord. Just imagine with me, if you will, the journey. Onesimus. Onesimus is growing in the Lord. Love is growing in his heart. His voice is singing. He's enjoying his freedom. And Paul says one day, Onesimus, it's time to go back. <laughs> Don't you know, if there were any words that Onesimus didn't want to hear, it was, it's time to go back. It's time to go back. It's time to go back to that place. That very thing that you were running from. That very bondage, that very affliction that, that, that you ran away. It's time to go back. 
But Onesimus, you're not going back the same person you were when you left. You are not going back the same person you were when you left. Paul goes on to say in verse 13, whom I would have retained, this Onesimus I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. We shift our focus for a moment to Paul. We begin to see the human side of Paul. Those of you that sometimes put your ministers, your pastors, or others on too high a pedestal. Who of us compares to the Apostle Paul in, in his ministry, in his discipleship, in his church planning, in his missions work, in his commitment and faithful service to the Lord, in the giving of himself to everything that is the gospel? Who of us compares? Yet we still see the human nature of Paul. Paul says, you know, Philemon, you're there. And I'm here. You're in the freedom of your home, Philemon. You're in the church and I'm, I'm in this prison and I kind of like having my son Onesimus here to minister unto me. I'm actually kind of reluctant to send him back. I'm, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a man of God, but I'm, I'm, I'm just from my personal nature. I'm kind of reluctant to tell him to go back and confront that. You know, the, the, there's a part of us that, that sometimes we want to stay where it's comfortable. Come on now. <laughs> Rather than going back and dealing with what may be uncomfortable. And there's a part of us that likes to keep that which is comfortable around us, hold it close, even if there are, the proper thing is to say, hey, you need to take some time. You need to go back. Uh, it's not real comfortable to have this conversation. It's not real comfortable to give this instruction. But because I love you, because I love you, because we are knitted together, I'm going to say to you, it is time to go back and deal with that circumstance. But, but you're not going back the same as you left. You're going back a different person. And you're not going back alone. Because your life is one with another now. You're going back. But your life is one with another. Verse 14, he says, But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. We shift our focus now from Paul to Philemon. Paul says to Philemon, Philemon, I told Onesimus it was time to go back. I'm sending him to you. But I want you to know, I wanted to keep him. But I'm not doing anything without your input. That's what it means when it says, thy benefit should not be a, is it were necessity, Philemon, I'm not telling you that you have to take him back. I want it to be your choice. We spoke recently about the second mile. There's an obligation to go the first mile. Paul's not saying, Philemon, I want you to fulfill the obligation to take Onesimus back. Paul's saying, Philemon, I want this to be your willing decision to receive him back. I want it to be your choice, not something I've decided for you. And, 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 and the truth is that for each of us, it needs to be our decision. It, it was Onesimus' decision. Paul said, I'm sending you back, but, but ultimately Onesimus had to make the decision to go. Ultimately Onesimus had to make the decision to go back to deal with what? he had run from, because he could have just run away from Paul the same way he ran away from Philemon. Some people just, they spend their whole life running, run from one place to another. And the funny thing is, they, they, they find when they get to the new place that the same trouble in the old place showed up in a new place. It's like, a, like you're carrying a backpack with you, dragging a trailer or something. 
run away from run away from the problems of the past, the afflictions, the bondages, the troubles, and you show up in a new place, and guess what? There they are again. And Paul says, as much as I'd like to keep you here, it's time to go back and deal with what was. Paul says, Philemon, it's your decision. I want you to decide if you're going to receive. I want you to do it willingly. Not because you're compelled, but because you're willing. It's the second mile. Verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive him forever. Paul appeals to Philemon's sense of wisdom. Philemon, please understand. I know Onesimus ran away. I know what he did was wrong. It, it, the circumstance was not good. But consider God has a greater plan. Amen? Amen. You, sometimes the immediacy of the moment, if, if we just look at the circumstances, if we just look at the immediacy of the moment, we're like, God, what are you doing? What is going on? How could this mess have anything to do with you? Yet, what we see in the middle of this circumstance is Paul says, you know, just maybe, just maybe, Philemon, this, this separation, this running away of Onesimus, this temporary separation, this temporary moment, maybe it was intended to bring about a greater good. Maybe he left for a little while, but he's coming back to you permanently. He's coming back to you changed. He's coming back to you different. He's going to be with you long term. You see, the reality of the matter is sometimes... Sometimes we're timid in what we say or what we do. We think that we have a relationship. Philemon thought he had a relationship with Onesimus because he possessed him. Come on, somebody. He held something on him. And sometimes maybe we think that we have a relationship with somebody, but it's not... A true relationship. It's not a peer-to-peer. -peer. It's because we're holding something. It's not a freely given relationship. And the reality of the matter is in that place, we really don't have a true relationship. The true love doesn't exist in that place. It's just another yoke of bondage. It's just another type of oppression. It's just another type of of improper. I mean, you can call it abuse, you can call it what you want, but it's not the right place, it's not the right thing. I even think that the Lord would say to us today that as There are moments where perhaps we hold our tongue. There are things that we don't share, things that we don't say or we don't do because we're afraid of losing a relationship. There, there may be people that we know that we think, well, you know, I'm not really going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not really going to be bold or put the words out there. Because I don't want to lose the relationship. I think the Lord would say to you, you're worried about losing something you don't really have. Because if you haven't really been real with somebody, if they don't really know that you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, they don't really know you. Amen. They, they know a mask. They know a lie. You've been lying to them. Yes. 
They know someone else. You don't have intimacy in that relationship. You don't have a real relationship. You don't have anything to lose. We're worried about losing relationships that we don't even have. Well, says Philemon, you know, you might have been worried about losing Onesimus, but what did you really lose? You lost just a slave. They may have been there for a while. He wasn't very profitable. You didn't have a long-term relationship with him. He was unprofitable. At some point, he's going to die, and there's nothing. But now, now, Philemon, I send to you, not a slave, but a brother. Yes. One who is one with me, coming into your presence. Verse 16, not now a servant do I send to you, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul, Paul says, you don't realize, Philemon, the treasure that is coming back to you. The blessing that is coming back to you. It's my son who I long to have with me. But he should be with you. For, for what you have shared, what you have experienced, you see, it's not just about Onesimus. This journey is about Philemon. This journey is about Paul. This journey is about you and me and the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 17, if, if thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If Onesimus has wronged you, Philemon, or if he owes you anything, if he owes you all, if he owes you anything, put it on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand, and I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest me, even thine own self besides. We shift our focus from Philemon back to Paul for a moment. One of the beautiful aspects of coming to know the Apostle Paul is we have so much of his writing. And we see so much of him. Listen. Listen to Paul now. Philemon, if you therefore consider me your partner in ministry, receive him as you would receive me. Amen? That's the gospel. Receive them as you would receive me. If he's wronged you. If there's anything he owes you, anything that's found lacking in him, put it on my account. Paul is absolutely being the Lord Christ. He is representing the love of Jesus Christ. He is representing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's not just a preacher. He's a man in the flesh living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is this not what Jesus has said for you and me? That when we go back home, when we go back to the very place from which we were running, come on somebody. Every person in here, I can make eye contact with every one of you and point to every one of you and say at some point you were running from God. And you could point at me and say, Preacher, at some point you were running from God. Every one of us was running away from home, running away from God, running away from the place that we were supposed to be. Yes. And we ran into somebody. Mm -hmm. We thought we were running away from somebody. We were running into somebody. We thought we were running away from God. We were running right into God's plan, right into God's purpose, right into God's trap. And I say trap in the most loving way possible. And so, just like Jesus, Paul says, when he gets there, if there's anything lacking, don't look at Onesimus. Put it on my account. If there's anything lacking in us, it, it, it's no longer on us if we're in Christ. It's on Jesus. Amen. It's his righteousness. When it comes time to settle accounts, when it comes... Well, if you're from the South, you'll know when it comes time to reckoning. 
when it comes reckoning day, when it comes time to give account, it's going to be the account of Jesus Christ, His blood, His righteousness that's looked at for judgment. Paul says, if there's anything lacking, put it on my account. I've written it with my own hand. Philemon, this is not someone else telling you that someone else said that someone else said that Paul said that he would cover the tab. Philemon, this is me writing in my own hand that his account is good. Yes, thank you, Lord. Jesus Christ wrote in his own blood. Jesus Christ wrote in his blood, in the scrolls of heaven, you, your name, my name, in salvation. It is the creed demonstrated and declared by the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, actually by both his hands, which were outstretched on that cross. For our salvation. Verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Refresh my heart. Let me have joy of thee. Brother, sister, let me see you do the right thing. Let me, let me hear testimony, Philemon. That in this difficult circumstance you made the right choice. Allow me to be encouraged. That my discipleship to you. Encourage your mentor by doing the right thing. Encourage your pastor by doing the right thing. Encourage your spouse by doing the right thing. Encourage your brother and your sister by doing the right thing. Allow them to see the testimony. Because that strengthens us in the Lord. Amen. Amen. That renews the right spirit in us. It, it encourages us. We are blessed of the Lord. Where is it? Verse 21. Paul says, I have confidence by Lehman. In thy obedience. I wrote unto you. I'm asking you to do this. Knowing that you will do this. And even more. Notice what Paul says. Paul. Makes a persuasive argument. To Philemon. Paul says to Philemon. Philemon. I want this to be your decision. But here's a few facts I want to lay down for you. He lays down a persuasive argument. And then Paul says, you know what, Philemon? I know despite my persuasive argument, the things that I've said, the things that I've shared, I know you're going to make the right decision. And not only do I know you're going to make the right decision, but I know that you're going to go the second mile. What a vote of confidence. What assurance, faith in the Lord. What a, what a, what a testimony, what a compliment to Philemon. Paul says, Wherewithal, prepare me also lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Notice, again, we talked about the human nature of Paul as we shift from Philemon back to Paul. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm longing to come back there. Paul selflessly gave himself in bondage and service and in all of this affliction. But he says, I, I, I still desire to be out of this difficult circumstance and to be back with you where it's comfortable. Now we know that, that Paul's journey was a difficult one. It's not just the journey of Onesimus. It's a journey of Paul. The, the journey that we take doesn't always look the way that we would have it to look. Paul has a human side. He says I'm to Nisimus that, you know, it's, it's hard for me to let him go. But he says, I will. I'll do the right thing. I'm asking you, Philemon, to do the right thing, but I'm, I'm confident that you will. But I'm still... 
person, I'm still going to ask. He still makes a persuasive argument. Notice the balance in Paul's life. He's balancing his, his spiritual life with his human nature. He's balancing what is right, what he knows he's supposed to do with his emotions, his heart. He's making difficult decisions and telling his spiritual son, you know, you should do this. This is what's right. It's not what's comfortable for me. It's not what's easy for you. Paul says to him, put it on my account. It's on me. Let me have joy. He asked him to do this very thing, willingly, not of necessity. He reminds him that he left, but he's coming back. And what you lost, you never really had. What you're getting back is better than what you ever lost. God's purpose is all in this. God's purpose is all over this. Onesimus is coming back different than he left. And there's one particular phrase that I truly want to share with you. And it's hiding on this page. In verse 19, Paul says, I've written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit. I do not say unto thee how thou owest me, even thine own self besides. Think about that last phrase. Paul says, I'm not saying to you, but I'm saying to you. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> Paul says, I'm not going to remind you that you owe your life, your salvation unto me. I'm not, not, not even mentioning that. Not even bringing that up in the conversation. I love the humility and the humanness of Paul. Paul's not pretending to be something he's not. Paul is, is a faithful minister in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he's true to himself. And he's true to Onesimus in this journey. And he's true to Philemon. And he's not hiding. He says, look, you know, I, this is what I'd like for you to do. I know this is the right thing. You know this is the right thing. I'm not even going to mention that, you know, you kind of owe me. I'm not even bringing that up. <laughs> but deep down inside, I know you're going to do the right thing anyhow. I, I just, we've got three individual lives that are so revealed, so expanded for us, expounded in the scriptures. Fascinating the relationships. But particularly the journey of Onesimus. Now Paul concludes his letter and he says the basic, you know, conclusion, verse 23, therefore salute Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Arisakis, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul says, Done. I'm back to my work here in the prison. I trust that you're going to do the right thing. As we conclude this message, let's take our eyes back off of Paul, back off of Philemon. Let's put him back for a moment on Onesimus. Which means, back on you and me. <laughs> Amen? Come on. We're the Onesimus in the room. We're the Onesimus. We're, we're the ones that were running. And we were the ones that encountered the presence of God. That's what Onesimus found in Paul. He found the presence of God. And we ran headlong into the presence of God. We were sure we were running away from something and we were actually running into something. In this journey of Onesimus,
just when he thought he'd gotten away, he found himself in more hot water than he was when he left. And then he encountered the presence of God. He thought he was a free man. And the presence of God said, go back. And deal with what you were running from. He says, under the place that he was running, willingly receive this your child who is returning. And this is a picture of our Lord in heaven who willingly receives us, not reluctantly, not grudgingly, not angrily, but gracefully, willingly receives us and, and lavishes on us abundantly, exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. Certainly what we deserve. Lavishly pouring out His grace. Blessing us with every spiritual blessing in the spiritual realm. I mean, we, we have so much of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the parable of the Good Samaritan in this story. Amen? We, we have the parable of the prodigal son. We have so much of the gospel lived out here. Paul, the figure of Christ, leading Onesimus, the one who's running to the truth, and then pointing him back home. And saying, go back, but go back different than you left. <clears throat> you see, God is going to send us back to what we were running from. Yes. But He's going to send us back different. Because we've had not just a redemption moment, but there should be a revelation moment. You see, I believe the Lord would say to us today that, that too many people have experienced redemption, but not revelation. Redemption without revelation leaves a person in bondage. Yes. Redemption without revelation leaves a person in bondage. You're still running from that thing. Yes. You're still bound by that past. You've been redeemed in the Lord. But you're still under that bondage. There's still a fear. There's still a running. There's still a, 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 a... But when revelation comes, revelation changes. Revelation breaks the bondage. It breaks the yoke. It breaks the fear. When the redemption comes with the revelation, or when the revelation comes with the redemption, it would be more accurate to say. We actually have a revelation of what the redemption has truly done. Who Christ is and who we are in Christ. That, that He utterly has, has, has broke every bondage. And he's, it's utterly shattered. He says, go back. Go back and confront that. But don't go back the same way you left. We've probably all known that person that could make us feel about this tall. We've probably all known that person that can make our blood boil without ever speaking a word, just a look at <laughs> the whistle blows. Probably some of us have known that one particular temptation that always just seemed to get the best of us. That bondage, whatever it what, there's something. And the Lord says, go back. But he's not sending us back so that we can be under the yoke of bondage again. He didn't send Onesimus back a slave. He sent him back a free man. Yeah. You see, it was Onesimus' choice to go back. Amen. It's one thing when you've been forced into something that you didn't choose. Oh, it, it, it came upon you, that, that thing. It came on you. It was forced on you. It wasn't what you asked. It wasn't what you wanted. It wasn't even what you were looking for. To some extent, you may not even know how it happened. But God said, get a revelation. Get a transformation. And, and, and when you are transformed by that revelation, when that redemption has actually manifested itself in revelation, say a rainbow word, a, say a rhema word. A rhema word. Rhema word. Rhema word. 
When that revelation has become a living word, for we live by faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's not a Logos word, that's a Rhema word. Faith comes by a living word, a Rhema word of God. Something that has become revealed into us. Something that is unveiled, something that has come alive. The Word of God, the redemption of God has come alive. It is made manifest in us. There is a victory, not that we've just heard about. There's not a victory that we've just written on a piece of paper. There's a victory that has come alive in us. We have become more than a conqueror. Conqueror is not just our name. It is something we are and something we do. When that comes alive, when the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the power of God yes. comes manifest in us, God says go back. Yes. But don't go back the same as you left. Go back a conquering hero. Yes. Go back more than a conqueror. And when you go back, you're going back so that you know mm -hmm. in everything in the spiritual realm knows yes. Yes. that not only was that bondage broken, but you're going back so you can see it and they can see it under your feet. You are going back to demonstrate the victory, to conquer the victory. That that thing that once held you no longer holds you. That that one thing that once scared you and caused you to run no longer causes you to run and causes you to be scared. But you are transformed. You are a new creation in Christ. Behold, all things are made new. You are more than a conqueror. You are the power and the presence of God invading that circumstance. Yes. Yes. 